All right. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Happy National Apprenticeship Week. Um, my name is Ivy Moore, and I'm the Apprenticeship Program Lead for the Department of Workforce Services. Um, we have brought to you an amazing panel of women who all participate within registered apprenticeship programs in Wyoming, and we're very excited to um, talk about their programs and some of their successes and some of the things that they hope to see in the future. Um, just some housekeeping. Um, we are recording this meeting, so um, this recording and any materials mentioned will be sent in a follow-up email after this panel has completed. Um, that'll be sent via email. Um, and then also, because this is a webinar platform, if you have any questions or comments, um, please go ahead and use the Q&A box that's at the bottom taskbar um, to put any questions or comments in for any of our panelists or myself. So we're going to go ahead and get started with some introductions. Um, we've got some amazing people here at this table. And um, if you would all start by talking about who you are, your organization, and what your role and experience is in registered apprenticeship programs. Um, if we could go ahead and start with Mike Broad, and then we'll go ahead and popcorn around. Hey, thank you, Ivy. My name is Mike Broad. I'm the Wyoming State Director for the Department of Labor Office of Apprenticeship. I have been the State Director for the past 15 years, and before that, I was involved in education. And basically in Wyoming for registered apprenticeship, I kind of cover it all in partnership with pretty much so most of the people you see on the panel. So thank you. All right, and then we can go to Laura. Hi, I'm Laura Baker. I run, I'm the executive director for Cyber Wyoming. We're a statewide nonprofit dedicated to small business, education, outreach, and awareness on cybersecurity topics. And um, our role and experience in, with apprenticeship is we, in 2017, we started our first apprenticeship program, um, primarily because we have um, a cybersecurity competition for small businesses every year. And we wanted to make sure that that labor wave of support was going behind the demand that we were creating when people became educated about how to manage the risks in their in their small company. Thank you. All right, we can go to Stevie. Um, my name is Stevie Osborne. I work for the city of Rollins. Um, I also was the first apprentice for the Rural Water Association here in Wyoming um, for water and wastewater apprenticeship program. So I was the first to graduate. So um, I think that's about it. Thanks, Stevie. Sure. All right, we'll pop one over to Christy. Hi, I'm Christy Gortel, and I'm the program manager of outreach and workforce development for Laramie County Community College in Cheyenne. Um, I oversee our HVAC and plumbing apprenticeship programs. I've um, been working with them for about three years. Prior to that, I uh, worked for Job Corps um, with some pre-apprentice learning opportunities uh, for those particular students. So um, although I have not been a registered apprentice myself, I have had uh, a really great opportunity opportunity to get to work with them so thank you and then Megan awesome well hi everyone my name is Megan Lane um, I am with the Wyoming Electrical JTC um, my my specific role is I am the office manager slash executive assistant to the training director which is Miss Brenda Morgan um, my specific duties as far as our apprenticeship goes is I kind of handle a lot of like clerical bills um, financial statements taxes all that kind of fun stuff um, general office manager duties but then I also assist the training director and any needs she has for the program um, I work alongside a Apprentices, helping them with their indenture packets as far as paperwork once they start the program, um, kind of help them understand the policies procedures. Um, I do things as far as processing their work reports each month. Um, I help them with their curriculum checkouts as far as books goes um, and their syllabus for their curriculum. Um, my personal experience as far as apprenticeship kind of started um, when my fiance actually went through the Wyoming Electrical JATC himself. Um, he started this at 18 years old, and I really, truly got to see firsthand how amazing um, an opportunity like this is. Um, for our for his opportunity, you know, he got to earn money while he learned this amazing trade. Um, so, you know, he 
you know, it, it was just a great opportunity, great benefits, low cost for a great education. So that's kind of my start. And I'm really happy to be here now. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. I'm really excited to have all of you here on this panel. I think that you all bring something different to the table as far as apprenticeships. So I'm really excited to start diving into our questions. So our first question for the panel um, is if you could describe your apprenticeship program, so maybe a snapshot of what the training may look like, the time frame that it takes to complete your apprenticeship, um, and maybe some other details, and how your organization got started with registered apprenticeship. And Megan, we might as well stick with you and, and start going back around. Sure. No, that sounds great. So um, our registered apprenticeship started in 1965. Um, we are a statewide inside wireman electrical apprenticeship. Um, we are four years, 8,000 hours. Um, that is also the state requirement to get your journeyman's license. Um, with our apprentices, they can work in any three fields as far as residential, commercial, or industrial type settings. Um, the big thing with our program too that we really like to put emphasis on is it's an earn while you learn program. Um, so there's great minimum um, but competitive starting wages. Um, there's opportunities for our apprentices to get benefits right away. And then as they advance in the program, there's opportunities for pension and annuity as well, which is just tremendous, tremendous to have. Um, there's opportunities, like I kind of said, um, for pay advancements as well as they kind of progress into the program. Um, and then the big thing with our program too is that contractors really value um, our apprentices in general. So they have a big, uh, they invest tremendously in our apprentices, um, which helps really keep the cost low for our apprentices too. So they can really focus on, on the program. Um, we are a day school as well, which is kind of unique compared to some apprentices in the state, um, but a huge positive. We seen, we've seen some great feedback with that. Um, our apprentices come to campus about six times per academic year. Um, so that's, that's kind of how our program is structured and how um, OJT, the on-job training, kind of works in correlation with the schooling. Awesome, thank, thank you. you. And then we'll go ahead and jump over to Laura. Can you talk a little bit about Cyber Wyoming and your apprenticeship program? Sure, thank you. Um, so we're a little bit different since we don't actually do the technical training for our apprentices. We have three different apprenticeship programs. Well, we actually do the training for one of our programs, but the we have three different apprenticeship programs. One is cybersecurity technician. Um, another is IT support specialist. So those are kind of for the, the new kids on the block. The cybersecurity technician is often used for the um, uh, those that have a little bit of experience but might want to round out their skills and get more into the cybersecurity field. And then the third one is cybersecurity business counselor. We just uh, registered that program last June. And that's for business advisors so that they can incorporate cybersecurity into their business advising services. Um, and we do train on that, just like the JATC trains their electricians. But our programs are, are different in that for the first two with the IT professionals, we're actually the sponsor for the program. So we recruit employers and try to match them up with apprentices if they're hiring, um, or they may hire their own apprentice and then register them in the program through our sponsorship. So we did all the hard work as a sponsor. We did all the paperwork with the Department of Labor and the State Apprenticeship Office through Mike Broad. Thank you, Mike. You were amazing. And, um, and you know, and just we did all that hard paperwork to make it an easier lift for our employers. And really, they have to fill out one form and review the standards. So that makes it a whole lot easier. And then we do require our technical professionals to train with us at Cyber Wyoming on soft skills. And these can be anything from conflict management to um, how to read an accounting statement, um, because we believe that today's um, apprentices are tomorrow's IT managers. And so our program is a little bit different, but we, like I said, we really try hard to take that burden off the employers. And since apprenticeship is free for employers, there's really no reason for them not to do it, especially since we took the paperwork burden off of them. Definitely, those are all great points to make. Um, Christy, we're gonna jump to you. Can you talk a little bit about the apprenticeship programs through LCCC? Sure, so we have two uh, registered apprenticeships. Uh, we are not the sponsor employers. We work in partner with local sponsor employers. So we provide the related instruction uh, for HVAC and plumbing um, in our area. Um, they 
they hire their apprentices and tell us who they are going to send us. Um, and we uh, pay and employ the adjunct instructors that teach our programs. Um, and then I uh, write the grants and do the grant management for the workforce Department of Workforce Services apprenticeship grants. And I work pretty closely with Mike Broad um, just to ensure related instruction in alignment with our uh, sponsor employment apprentice, uh, appendix A's and those types of situations. Um, ours are 8,000 hours as well. Um, the goal is for them to take their journeyman exam after their four years. Uh, they do their related in the evening generally, but we do have a couple of companies that prefer to do them during the day. So we we kind of customize that uh, based on uh, the need of an individual company and then also kind of the industry need in our area. So um, that that's pretty much the, the block of it. How many apprentices I have from a year to year seems to ebb and flow depending upon uh, the needs of the employers. So. Thank you. Yeah. It's great to hear the different perspectives within apprenticeship and how apprenticeship can really be delivered in so many different ways. And there can be different partners. You can have you know, a sponsor that has participating employers, or you can have an employer that is both the sponsor and the training provider. And then we also have you know, the community colleges involved providing some of that training as well. So definitely great perspectives to hear from. Um, Stevie, can you tell us a little bit about your experience going actually through an apprenticeship program and kind of what that looked like as far as how it was structured? Sure. So um, I got on the WARS apprenticeship program pretty early. It was I was the first one to sign up. So it was kind of still one of those learning curves, um, kind of figuring out how we wanted to build the program or Riata wanted to build the program and whatnot. And um, it's a two year program for either water or wastewater operators, and you can choose one or the other, or you can do both. And if you do both, it's a three-year program because you kind of, some of the training um, go hand in hand together. Um, so I got in got in with the Riata doing that. And we did, I did all my on, on the job training for the city of Rollins and did my hours there. And then I think it was once a month give or take, depending on weather. Um, we would go to other facilities and um, check out their water systems. So all the things that I would read in my books to get my certifications that I don't have in my facility, I was able to go and get hands-on training and get a better understanding of the other systems in the state. Um, because every water and wastewater facility is totally different. So, but you gotta, you gotta learn them all, even if you don't touch them. So that really helped. It helped me pass my certifications. It helped me connect with other operators. And there's been a few times too, where things have come up at my facility. And I knew that these operators that I had met during my training, they, they had dealt with something similar or they had used equipment that now I'm trying to buy and stuff. And so it's came in handy quite a bit. It was uh, really cool. <laughs> That's awesome. I love hearing the, the perspective coming directly from an apprentice because you know, when we're looking at these big programs, we're looking from this outside lens of setting it up and what it looks like on paper, but then having you actually go through it and give that perspective is awesome. So thank you for sharing. Yeah. We're gonna go ahead and move on to our next question. Um, and I'm gonna actually start with Mike Rod. Um, can you describe how apprenticeship is different compared to other traditional training models? Well, registered apprenticeship, I'm gonna take it in two parts. Registered Apprenticeship is a Department of Labor vetted training program, and they have gone through and approved the different occupations with industry specialists um, throughout the nation to determine the length of the on-the-job learning and the related instruction components, and then have also worked with um, industry specialists and ONET.com um, to develop what the work processes would look like. And so we could have, where we have national programs, we is, was very involved in a national approved program we brought down to the uh, local level in Wyoming. And so we will have national programs, national guideline programs, and then we have what would be local programs, which is the rest of the um, individuals that spoke, Laura and Christy and 
and all the, they have local programs so that we can look at what we spe the specific needs are within the company, the locality, you know, the state or whatever. And so um, because it is a DOL approved or vetted program, there are regulations we do need to meet within that program um, and develop it and align to our 2929 um, guidelines, which are quality guidelines, and then 2930, which are um, EEO guidelines. So we do have these aspects that we do have to meet in regard to registered apprenticeship. Now, anybody can have an apprenticeship program, um, but with DOL, you will also receive certification. So the company that writes a program becomes a certified training site for their employees. And then each of the apprentices as they complete the program will receive a nationally recognized cert certification as well. On, re on just uh, apprenticeship programs, they are usually um, industry or company specific and um, there are no certificates unless it would be industry specific for um, different types of learning that they would receive. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's great to hear that perspective from the Office of Apprenticeship and, and talking about the high standard that, that apprenticeships have. Um, we, we make sure that they are quality programs for long-term sustainable employment and long-term training that can really be implemented industry-wide. So thank you. I, I, we definitely appreciate that information. Um, Megan, we'll go ahead and jump to you. Can you talk a little bit about how um, the apprenticeship model is different in your electrical occupation than the traditional training um, models? And you're muted. <laughs> Happy Thank you. All. Thank you so much. <laughs> no, that's a great question. Um, for me, in my experience, um, I think that they differ. Um, the big thing is that they that you can earn what you learn. In my opinion, um, you know, with with our specific program, apprentices can come in, um, and they're not just focused on the schooling aspect necessarily. Um, they start working on their on job training as well. Um, so I think that definitely puts them a little bit above, um, in my personal opinion, just because I think that that helps them. Um, they've got a little bit of confidence once they go into the field. Um, they are essentially, you know, aside from needing to take that test, you know, they're journey level workers. They're ready to take on that load um, to help their contractors, you know, fulfill jobs, um, get those completed in a timely and very efficient and effective manner. Um, so to me, that, that's one of the biggest differences with um, like our specific training program is that we get the schooling, but we also make sure that they're touching the materials that they're learning about. And even here when they're on campus visiting us, um, we make sure diligently that they're going out into the labs, um, doing these hands-on training so that they feel confident that, oh, if I see this in the field, I'm going to rock it out of the park and I'm, I'm going to be great at this skill. So to me, that's that's one of the biggest differences. Yeah, that hands-on training is critical. You know, when we're looking at traditional education pathways, most of it, that education is front-loaded. So yes. um, you're sitting in a classroom day after day, and then when you get thrown onto your job site or into your career, it's like, okay, what do I do now? So that apprenticeship program, and really you're taking that education that you're learning in the classroom and directly implementing it right after you learn it. So you're really setting that in stone for your trainees, so that's, that's a great point. Absolutely. Um, Laura, can you talk a little bit, coming from a, a non-traditional occupation, um, how your apprenticeship program stands out from the traditional you know, training modules and models that are in your current field? Sure. So a lot of apprenticeships in the past have been time-based. You hear 8,000 hours, four years minimum. Um, competency apprenticeships are a little bit different. They still have a minimum number of hours you have to put in, um, but you're going through and showing that you master a task or a concept. Um, so for an IT professional that's going through a competencies list, they might, you know, it's really kind of nice because the employer can, can customize it. They Maybe one employer wants to say, I want you to learn about it first, so go research it, then read a book, start studying towards a certification, then I want you to sh shadow us, and then I want you to do it two or three times. So maybe they have five columns showing that they've mastered this, this task. 
And it can be anything from something for server administration or network administration or um, help desk support or um, group policy or employee policies and, and being able to explain those to new employees. So it can be, it's a it's a broad range of, of tasks that are there. And the really nice thing about the competencies list is because, you know, if you have one employer that they say, this one doesn't make any sense. And another employer that says, boy, we do a lot of video conferencing. We want to add three or four more competencies. They can. Um, the structured learning plan is a template. And as long as we document why we're taking or modifying a competency and what we're adding to it, we can make it completely fluid in a, lit in a living document um, that meets their needs. Because in the world of tech, it changes daily. I mean, um, uh, artificial intelligence has shown us that in the last six months, that things are really changing in my world. And, and very soon, quantum computing is going to do the same and blockchain has, has changed things. So that having that flexibility for the employer on these competencies is really, really important. And, and like I said, they're just, they're just job functions. You do a, you know, you show a task and, and you've, you say, okay, I've got the knowledge, I've got the skills and the ability, and now I've mastered it. Yeah, that's a great point to make that, you know, there really are three different kinds of registered apprenticeship programs. We've got the time-based where that's, you know, the traditional 2,000 to 4,000 hours. They have to meet those minimum hours in order to move forward to get their license. And then we've also got these competency-based apprenticeship programs where you're given a task and you have to master that in order to move on to the next task. And then we can even look at a hybrid of those two where maybe they have minimum hours and then minimum competencies that they have to accomplish before they can get any sort of credential or licensing. So thank you, great point to bring up. Christy, can you talk a little bit about how apprenticeships are different from the traditional model that the community colleges or some of our education entities um, provide? Um, ours are different in a sense. So since we are not their actual employer, since they work with their sponsor employer, we work very heavily in partnership with them, which does require quite a bit of communication and kind of back and forth in terms of progress um, back in, in, in those areas. Um, they do uh, on the job training during the day and they also are paid during the day. However, I don't have a lot of uh, work with the on the job training component that's very much in the sphere of the um, employer and we very much function in the grant management and the related instruction side of things and so um, since we all have some pretty defined roles it does um, require us to be pretty communicative about what's going on during the day versus in the evenings and so on and so forth however I also feel like it gives a richer um, experience for our apprentices because oftentimes our adjunct instructors um, are maybe working like maybe their commercial and that particular plumbing apprentice works pre predominantly residential. It gives them a lot more of a richer experience because they're going to get a lot more diversification that maybe they wouldn't get in their OJT, um, that they're going to get in their related instruction because their subject matter expert is teaching them something more specific to that. Or vice versa, we might have somebody who's an adjunct instructor who does pr primarily residential or industrial. And it, it does the same thing. So I feel like it gives a very enriching um, experience for all apprentices. The other thing that I like um, that I think makes us a little bit unique is that our apprentices um, in that classroom are a mixed group um, from various companies. And I think that that gives them um, a, a way to kind of build community and know other people from other companies and, and be able to really understand how diverse that their industry is. Um, so I guess we're a little bit different in that sense uh, since our OJT and related instruction aren't all with one company. Um, but I think it does that diversification, like I said, makes it a richer experience. Yeah, I definitely agree. Um, Stevie, talking from an apprentice perspective, how was going through an apprenticeship program different than some of your other trainings you've had previously? Well, um, it was nice having people that were in the same boat as me learning this like kind of seemingly overwhelming amount of information about things 
that you never thought about before. <laughs> um, so that that was that was kind of nice having people going, like, oh man, you have to read a book this thick and know everything about it. And you know, and a lot of the time, like I said before, you don't mess with a lot of the things that you're reading about because you have to know it about every different type of system and every way of treating and everything troubleshooting that can come up and um when you first start it's kind of overwhelming it's kind of scary and you kind of feel like am i capable of doing this <laughs> and having having other apprentices who are struggling and feel the same way and like sitting back going oh my gosh um that was that was pretty nice um and then you just kind of like i said before the way that you can, because I'm, um, I'm a bit of an introvert who knows how to ex extrovert when it's necessary. <laughs> but in like these big conferences and stuff that you go to, everybody's like, go and talk to people. Well, I don't know them. <laughs> so the first time I went to a conference, I didn't talk to anybody. And then because of the apprenticeship program, um, I had built these like kind of personal relationships with some of the other operators in different systems throughout the state. And, and because I became comfortable with them, now I'm, I walk into a conference and I, I know a bunch of the people there and I can call them up and ask them questions and email them. And it's, it gave me a sense of comfort and confidence that I, I don't know if I could have gotten it without the program just um knowing that they're having especially I don't know if you guys like Rollins has had some water issues <laughs> you know and uh I don't know if I could have held my head up as high as I did um without knowing their backstories too and hearing how they went through things and things went wrong for them and it it really um gave me a sense of confidence and being able to kind of share in that with somebody and not just be my nose stuck in a book and just trying to learn it all on my own. Yeah, that's, that's definitely true. Um, and I think that a lot of apprentices feel that same way, that sense of camaraderie and having, you know, going through it as a team, whether you're from the same business or not. So I think that's a good point to make. Maybe we'll, we'll stay with you for a second. And can, can you talk about what some of, um, how you've benefited from registered apprenticeships? And then we'll oh. go back. Sure. So um, I started out in like bottom of the totem pole for water and wastewater. I had no idea about it. It was just something um, that I kind of fell into by accident and, and then fell in love with. Um, and, and so I got with the program, I got um, my level one, level two and level three water treatment. So um, I'm one away from the highest you can get in the state of Wyoming. And I also received my level one wastewater treatment. Um, I have, Riata had me go through the CSM program. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of that. It's, uh, I think it's critical skills mastery. Um, and there's this incredibly intelligent guy who came up with it. And he's got intelligent people on his team. And boy, oh, that was hard. <laughs> and um she had me go through that and I, so I guess I, if you don't mind, I'm going to back up real quick. And I was a high school dropout. I dropped out in 10th grade, actually early 10th grade. Um, and then I had my daughter and I got my GED and I never would have thought that um, I would have built very much for myself, but I have. And through this program, I have gotten all my certifications to be certified to my facility. Um, and I have gotten college credits um, through this. I have gotten um, like OSHA 10s and all different kinds of trainings and a ton of leadership training, a lot of confidence that I never would have had any other way, I don't think. Um, and because of all of these different skills and the confidence level that I was able to achieve with this program, um, I was giving the... I, I got the supervisor's position for the city of Rollins. So now I'm <laughs> uh, trying to do the best that I can at being a leader for my team. And um, hopefully soon um, I'll have an, an apprentice of my own and I get to be a mentor and kind of help them 
And then on top of that, I get to talk with you guys and I get to get to do these really cool things and share my story and try to inspire other people to see that apprenticeship programs is it's valuable and you don't have to go into debt to have a career that means something to you and that you're proud of. You can build a life and and learn something at the same time. And, and, and at the end of the day, you can be really proud of yourself and the people around you. So. Thank you so much for sharing your story, Stevie. I, I've heard it a couple of times and it gets me every time and I'm just so proud of you. And it's it's great to see firsthand how an apprentice can move through these programs and excel and get into a career that they wanted all along. Um, and like you mentioned, without student debt and with these you know certifications that you can take far and wide. So I appreciate you sharing your story. Well, and and if I could piggyback onto that too, um, you know, Stevie, that's fantastic. I congratulations to you because, you know, one thing just from my personal experience, you know, I I did go the collegiate route. I have a bachelor's from the University of Wyoming, but that is not always the route for everybody either. Just through being in this apprenticeship, what I've seen is that that traditional college path it's just not for everyone. Yeah. And through my experience too, with with my fiance, I mean, he started this apprenticeship the JATC apprenticeship right away at 18. And, and it's been a viable career. I mean, he's got benefits, retirement. I mean, he's, he's a well-rounded electrician and he actually too now teaches at the JATC. So it, it's just been so awesome to see him grow his career and you don't have to go that traditional route. So mm -hmm. it's great to see that. Definitely. I agree to add. Um, you know, I think that we have, um, looking at our high schoolers, we want to retain those high schoolers and we want to keep people in Wyoming and just having multiple pathways for those students to take, whether it is college, whether it's an apprenticeship program, even if it starts in just shadowing or internships, giving them the opportunity to see what's available in Wyoming so that we could potentially retain them and train them and grow our own experts in our industries I think is really where the focus needs to be. It's not one or the other, it's the and. We have this and. So definitely a great perspective to bring up. Um, Laura, can you talk a little bit about how um, your business has benefited and maybe some of your, your other sponsors, how they've benefited, or your, excuse me, your employers, how they've benefited from the apprenticeship program? Sure. Um, well, we send a employer survey out annually and five stars is the highest you can get for the apprenticeship program. And all of them are, it always is 4.8 to 4.9. I mean, it's, um, and it's primarily because employers, um, apprenticeship is free for employers. Um, they get extra support in training their um, employee and apprentice or their apprentice um, through the soft skills training or like what Christy was talking about, the LCCC support um, with the classroom and the community. We even created an alumni group for our tech professionals that have graduated from the apprenticeship program so they can get together. And it's usually just an hour once a quarter where they can get together and say, where are you today? What have you learned? You know, trade, you know, it's just a networking event. And And here's the thing. So the tech world, Usually you have turnover within two years, um, and this is not unusual for Wyoming as well. Um, 18 months to two years is the typical turnover rate. So out of all the apprentices that have graduated, and I think there's six, only one has left their company. So we're way above that 20 to 30% retention rate. And I think what it is, really what it is, is that, like Stevie said, people care about you. You're developing that community. You've got that mentor. And once you realize, man, this is really, you know, I'm really supported here. I feel like I have so many people I can call. I, you know, I, I'm feeling confident about my job. You don't want to leave. You know, it creates that really good employee engagement environment. And I think that's the case for all apprenticeships. I mean, when when employers put that, just let little extra into it, which isn't that much, really. It it makes a big difference. And and then the and then the apprentice also gets, you know, they get a Department of Labor um, recognized certificate that's recognized nationwide. So 
Um, in tech, it's almost a dual credit program, right? Because they can be studying for a technical certificate or a vendor certificate, and they get credit for it on the apprenticeship certificate as well. So yeah, that's kind of nice too. So I definitely think that's what sets apprenticeships out compared to some of these other training opportunities is that these apprenticeship programs are truly investing in their employees beyond what is traditionally expected. You know, you're getting the hands-on training, the mentorship, the education, the certificates, the credentials. And, and I think that these employees that become apprentices truly feel invested and cared for because of all of these efforts that are put into this quality training opportunity. So I definitely think that we're on to something here with apprenticeships and the investment that we make. And I think that's where that retention rate comes in. Um, nationally, it's it's even higher than that, it's 94%. So on a national rating, if we're getting 94% retention, I can only imagine what it is in Wyoming and some of our smaller employers that are truly seeing these apprentices as families. So it's a great point to make. Um, Christy, I'm gonna jump over to you. Um, can you talk a little bit about how apprenticeship, how you've benefited from apprenticeship to LCCC and then maybe some of the support you guys have received for apprenticeships? Well, I think we benefit just by being able to fulfill a community need. Um, I just think that that that's huge. Um, having the partnerships that we have are, I think, are just a huge benefit for just our area. Um, oftentimes, things like related instruction, it's a heavy lift for an employer to see how am I going to how am I going to provide that component and being able to pool resources and really work together in a collaborative way, even though like in their day jobs, oftentimes they're competition, but I don't feel that way in the evening. So with with the apprentices, I mean, I think the competition is probably a little bit more on the friendly side in that aspect. So I think we as a community benefit. Um, I think LCCC benefits as a whole because we're a part of the community and we're here to fulfill that need of outreach and workforce development. That's one of our missions and it's one of the pillars in which we were founded on when we were when we were established in the 60s. So um, I feel in that sense um, that's where the benefit comes in. And the fact that we are able to be maneuverable and change as our as apprenticeship needs to change, as our community changes, and as our employer needs change. And I'm sorry, Ivy, I know there was a second part of that question, and I can't for the life of me remember right now. Will you mind repeating that? Yeah. Um, can you talk about some of the support that you've received having oh, this apprenticeship thanks. opportunity? Thank you. So support, I mean, you guys at Department of Workforce our Services are awesome. I mean, I don't think... It would thrive and a registered apprenticeship would thrive and grow like uh, it does if we didn't have the financial support from Department of Workforce Services and our state legislature truly understanding what our community needs, what our state needs, and understanding that this is really a viable option and this is really how we're going to grow our economy. Um, so that kind of support, of course, Mike Rod, always love you, Mike. So sad that you're to retire um just because i mean if there's ever a question about a registered apprenticeship mike is like the guru bible knows it all so that support is huge um and being able to help employers um when i uh when i go to the different events i have uh to connect and uh to people who believe it or not don't know anything about registered apprenticeship or what they or what they think they know is maybe a little bit antiquated and isn't really the realities that are today um and so i think that those are all just great benefits and i feel how we're feel supported um so hopefully i got that answer out for you okay yeah definitely thank you for mentioning the grants so the department of workforce services has a handful of apprenticeship grants available um, that are both state and federally funded um i won't go you know too long on my soapbox but if you're interested in any of those apprenticeship grants please don't hesitate to reach out um i'll go ahead and put my contact information into the q a chat so all of the attendees can see that um you know this funding is really important for our apprenticeship programs. We have a grant that supports that related um, that related instruction, the supplemental classroom education, and we can reimburse for a lot of those costs. We also have on-the-job learning reimbursement available through the Department of Labor. 
And then we're also working on developing a pre-apprenticeship grant. So we're looking at the different pathways that our 16 to 24 year old population can go through to get those prerequisite skills needed to directly enter into the workforce and utilize these registered apprenticeship programs. Um, and there's quite a bit of funding available there through an ARPA grant. So just a little plug on the grants. Um, I would like to open it up to either Laura or Megan. Um, do you guys have anything to add as far as some of um, the support you guys have received as a registered apprentice? That's a great, that's a great question, Ivy. Um, as far as ours, um, the biggest thing for us as far as growth in that regard um, is we actually receive contractor contributions. Um, those contributions are outstanding for us. Um, they help with operating costs and they really, the biggest thing is they help keep the costs low for apprentices. Um, like you said, the big thing is people wanna feel like they're part of a family. And I feel like these contractors, they're really investing in these apprentices and really trying to show them like, you know, we value you, we value what you're gonna bring to this industry and what you're gonna bring um, once you break out in four years. Um, so that is a big way that our um, RJATC, um, how we experience growth is through contractor contributions um, and again, keeping those costs low for apprentices. To kind of touch on that too, um, like with our apprentices, um, they only pay, first years only pay about $210. And that's for a registration for their entire first year. Um, it does increase by about $50 um, per year. So a second year would be about 260, but um, really low costs, really, really low. So thank, thankfully to those contractors and them valuing that investment in our apprentices, that's, that's how we're able to see a big part of that for our, our program. Yeah, and that's, that's great to hear that different perspective coming from, you know, the, the JATC and how your employers are truly investing in that training center and the program that you have available. So thank you for sharing. Thank you. So tech's a little bit different. Um, there are, there's national initiatives for technical professions across the state or across the U.S. Um, and they're, they're registered apprenticeship partners that Cyber Wyoming's been able to partner with. And some of these partners are like the Cybersecurity Youth Apprenticeship Initiative. They helped us create pre-apprenticeship standards for cybersecurity technician um, in Casper. And we had a collaboration between Kelly Walsh High School and Casper College and Cyber Wyoming and a couple of employers and the CTE Association. And we actually developed pre-apprenticeship standards to create that pathway from high school to um, tech apprenticeship. Um, we also partnered with Saffle Partners and they are great because they um, it opened up the tech apprenticeship quite a bit. We participated in creating new apprenticeship standards with them for like database specialists that we don't have, but we could now offer it through them and it's already pre-made, but they also provide online learning modules. And in tech, you know, it is such a broad field. I mean, you could specialize in storage, you can specialize in backups, networking, server management, or in Wyoming, a lot of times you have to kind of wear that hat and, and do everything, which is almost impossible. You become an IT generalist, which is great, but um, at the same time, you know enough about everything to get into a lot of trouble. <laughs> and, and, you know, it, 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 if you can find a 20, um, 20 years experienced person, you know, good luck because they're either running their own business or teaching their, their, the employees underneath them. Um, it's really, really hard. So these, the online learning modules and the training that you can get online, they can be expensive. I mean, they can be three or $4,000 a year just for, um, just for one person and one user license to get them that background information. And, you know, I know community colleges have those classes too. Um, so that's good. But again, we're also struggling for instructors nationwide. And so right now, LCCC's cybersecurity program is excellent. They've got stable instructors. They've had it going for three or four years. And Casper Colleges is good too, but they're really relying on adjunct because they just hired a, a brand new cybersecurity person for their department. And it's, it's like that across the state. I mean, the turnover rate is high. Community colleges struggle to pay enough when industry pays double. Um, and so 
you know, having these online training modules and having them for free through some of our partners is a huge benefit to employers because they don't have to pay that extra two grand a year per person to get into this online training module. Um, and then if they can network with some people at one of the local community colleges, it makes it even better. Yeah, definitely a great point to make. And, and I do think that, um, you know, talking about the struggle to keep instructors, I think it's really important to mention that, you know, at most of our community colleges, um, when we're looking at that non-credit side, a lot of those instructors are also employees of those company. They're working both sides. You know, they're working at the community college after hours to instruct these apprentices and give them that technical knowledge and then they're also turning around and showing back up at the work site first thing in the morning or showing up onto a job and they're working all day too, right alongside with these guys and mentoring them. So, so yeah, that's, that's definitely a, a great point to make in some of the differences that, that we see. Um, Mike, I'm going to jump over to you. Um, with you being with the Office of Apprenticeship for so long, can you talk about how apprenticeships have changed over the last few years and kind of where you see apprenticeships going in the future. Okay, um, you know, initially registered apprenticeship, and I'm gonna address registered apprenticeship, was addressed post-war era to train the soldiers coming back home. And at the time, the model that was utilized was predominantly the old school union programs. And, you know, so you, you went to work and then at night you had your trainings and you know, worked real hard like that. And it was predominantly in the trades. But apprenticeship has changed tremendously. Not only have the union programs adapted very well, like Megan was saying, their day classes. I mean, they, they are changing and evolving to meet the needs of the employers, the apprentices, the communities, you know, and even in the state. Um, and so we, we've seen a great deal of that type of change in the trades, but now registered apprenticeship is expanding exponentially in the non-traditional trades or the non-traditional occupations. Um, I just wrote a K-12 um, principal program. We've got K-12 teachers, Laura's IT constantly expanding. <clears throat> Because our needs out in our communities, in our world, in our industries right now are changing tremendously. And as more and more people realize that, you know, there is registered apprenticeship out there. It's amazing how well I know all of the people on this call talk to other people constantly. And um, we're always sharing our stories or whatever, but it's still the best kept secret. But I, I am seeing as more industries realize the value of registered apprenticeship. You know, um, earn what you learn behind Megan. We have grow your own as well as what you learn as, as you go through the stages of apprenticeship. And as they see the value in that learning where you're using more modalities of learning, the theoretical learning or, you know, um, the classes, as well as taking the practical application or the hands-on aspects to it <clears throat> and using more modalities of learning to be more competent in those skill sets, we're going to see more and more non-traditional, more and more um, occupations that maybe in the past have required that four-year degree and then need to start everybody out once they've had four years of education out in developing the learning skill sets or the comp meeting the competencies or whatever. And we're seeing more and more occupations, types of businesses um, out there that are looking at apprenticeship to basically save their types of training to get more people involved in it. Um, and realizing the need is not, like Megan said, not everybody needs that four year degree. And, but if you have technical training, then registered apprenticeship gives you that pathway for all those multiple occupations and outside of specifically just the mindset of the trades out there. Um, like I said, a Laura Baker's program has just grown exponentially through the years in meeting the needs in Wyoming. You know, Laura's fantastic in expanding it out there and in chasing 
in looking at what the needs are, but not only that, but the industry partners that she is partnered involved with are helping all of this to evolve to meet those needs. So that's how I see um, registered apprenticeship have changed. How I would like to see it for the future. I would like to see it as a recognized pathway for all of our United States culture out there um, that you know we not only have four-year college, we have registered apprenticeship is a recognized pathway and you know, along with the military. And um, I would like to see <clears throat> all companies have free apprentices. I would like to have all high schools have youth apprenticeship programs and apprenticeship training. Not a little selfish at all, but I just really think that that would help all industries out there. And, um, and mostly in Wyoming, help us keep our young people. That's our biggest export. And I would like to see more and more of this developed in Wyoming to help keep the others. They can go to other states and get a lot of these registered apprenticeships. So I would like to see our industry partners um, get more involved so that we can offer it here in Wyoming. Thanks, Mike. We definitely appreciate your vision and we will work hard to get that vision <laughs> up and going and keep it going. I'd like to add to that vision if I can. I mean, Ivy, you and I and Stevie, maybe, and maybe Christy, I think you were there. Um, we were at the Connect to Women conference and um, in September. And I asked everybody, I said, who's hired in the last three or four months and who, in, or who intends to hire in the last three or four months? And I want to say almost everybody in that room raised their hand. I mean, it was daunting to see that. And I said, all of you could benefit from registered apprenticeship. And if you go out to apprenticeship.gov and look at the job seeker or the apprenticeship job seeker, you can see that there's apprenticeship standards for office administrator, office specialist, HR manager. I mean, it is not just for, you know, electrical and welding anymore. It's right. for anybody. And and if 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 you as an employer are hiring a lot of office specialists. Maybe it's a medical office specialist, for instance, for a medical group. You can take advantage of some of the Department of Workforce Services grants out there. Use a, a structured learning plan that comes off of the apprenticeship.gov or working with the state apprenticeship office um, that Mike um, runs. And you can create your own standards. And it doesn't take that long. Somebody like Mike is amazing because they walk you through it. Um, and and then when you hire, you get all these extra benefits with industry partners like Megan was talking about and I was talking about and with the Department of Workforce Service partner. Yeah, I definitely think that's a great point to add that really apprenticeships have evolved in so many different ways, but expanding those occupations has been, I mean, an amazing thing that has happened over the last five and 15 years, um, really looking at how, you know, these, these traditional pathways, maybe for healthcare, maybe for, you know, IT, education, all of these pathways can utilize this registered apprenticeship model to grow our own experts, to grow our own teachers, medical assistants, um, cybersecurity technicians, you know, it is, it is incredible how um, apprenticeships is really, truly one of the only one size fits all workforce development solutions. Um, it can work for traditional trades, these non-traditional. Um, and I'd love to jump over to Megan and ask you as a traditional trade, how has the electrical JTC changed their apprenticeship program to meet the modern day needs? And what do you see for the future of the JTC? Um, you know, I would say as far as modern day needs, um, we're really expanding on that it's that this is a program for everybody. Any mm -hmm. anybody, male, female, uh, minorities, that really anybody can get into this program. Um, Ivy, I'm so sorry. Would you mind touching on that again, that question you asked? I'm sorry. Yeah, just how has the JTC changed? Um, and then also um what do you see for the future of the JTC? Perfect. So yeah, so that would be for me the biggest set of changes is again just that we're you know targeting toward uh, males, 
males, females, and minorities more to, you know, EEOC compliance. Um, I see us, you know, in the future, just continuing to grow. Um, th to me, there's always going to be, you know, a need for tradespeople. So I feel like, you know, we're going to continue to target that this isn't just, you know, for males specifically. Again, this is this is an occupation that anybody can get into. Because um, one thing here at the JATC that we really do truly pride ourselves on is that anybody from any background can come into this with little to no experience or understanding of this. And that's our job to get you to feel confident, um, to get you working out into the field and feel like, yeah, this is absolutely a viable career for me um, and something something that I can do. So I just I see us in the future, um, you know, continuing to target towards all individuals that this is a great and viable career, um, you know, a little off the non-traditional path, but it, it's absolutely still a viable career. So I, that's how I can see us continuing to grow. Yeah, absolutely. I think diversity is definitely something that all apprenticeship programs are striving for, you know, making sure that it is equitable and inclusive for everyone to participate in. Um, there are so many different kinds of registered apprenticeship programs and I really think that there, there could be a place for anyone in a number of those apprenticeship programs. So definitely a great point to make and really exciting to see some of those diversity um, th that, that coming to life um, across the entire state. So great point. Um, Christy, I, as far as the community college goes, how have things changed for registered apprenticeships and where do you see apprenticeships going in the future for the college? Um, well, I think change has come over the years just in where does it really belong. There was a desire at one point to make it an associate's degree um, because that was valued at that time. And then um, I think it's we've kind of come back to full circle and have decided that it really belongs in non-credit programming. Um, but um, I'm super excited for how our state is kind of looking at integrating non-credit versus academic for credit programming. So for example, um, if we have a person that goes through our registered apprenticeship training programs and turns out is with their journeyman license and wants to come back and get their associate's degree, they'll give them credit for those classes um, and only will require them to complete their general education credits in order to get their associate. So they don't start from square one. And I think it's just evaluating the totality of a person's knowledge and giving credit for previous experience and previous learning, even if it didn't fit in this traditional pretty little box that it used to be in. And so um, I think that's how it's evolved. And I, it makes me very excited for the future as we move forward, just because um, I think registered apprenticeship has always been kind of uh, portable and what that apprentice wants for themselves. Everybody's careers evolve and change. And, you know, when you're 18, uh, you're on a path, and that doesn't mean that your path will be the same when you're 25 or 30 or where, wherever you might find yourself. And knowing that by going through a registered apprenticeship program, that um, no matter where your career evolves and changes, that you will, that that is your knowledge and that you will be able to apply it um, in pretty much any facet of education if you so chose. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's amazing to hear that the community colleges are recognizing that these industries that may be on that non-credit side, that that some of those employees do want to go back for credit and get a degree and they want to continue in that pathway. So um, thank you for sharing. Well, we are actually out of time. I think this conversation could go on and on and on. Um, but again, I just want to thank our panelists for their time and your expertise in apprenticeships and all of the work that you're doing in the reg registered apprenticeship system. Um, I think we've got a lot of work ahead of us, but it will be fun to, to get it all done and keep growing apprenticeships in Wyoming. Um, I wanna thank everybody that attended and we'll go ahead and follow up with um, information about the panel and the recording. I've, al I've also gone ahead and put my email into the chat if you have any questions for any of the panelists that may have not been answered or if you'd like to connect with the panelists um, please reach out to me and we will get you connected and I just want to say thank you again happy national apprenticeship week thank you bye thank you all thanks everyone thank you thank you Ivy for putting this together this is great what a great
team there, I felt a little under underwhelming with overwhelmed, excuse me, with all the panel members. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Bye. Guys. Thank you, Ivy.